This is Booker T. Washington High School. Welcome. Um, we are in Norfolk, Virginia. We are definitely um, Come on in. an urban school. It's um, a geometry class. They take the SOL at the end of the year. Most of the students are 10th graders. There are a good number of 9th graders, a couple of 11th graders, and a couple of 12th graders. All right, we're going to start with Deanna. What do you already know? Okay, we just finished congruent triangles right before the semester ended, and now we're going straight into similar figures, similar polygons, similar triangles, okay? There were a couple of objectives. Um, the first one was to make sure that they understand what similar polygons meant. What is the idea of a similar polygon versus what they've already known, which is congruent polygons? How are they different? How are they similar? Et cetera. So that was the big objective. So in order to start that off, I got to know where we are. The learning activities, the first one was actually an anticipatory set that I wanted to use just to pull what they already knew out of them. Um, a lot of times I want to make sure that we don't spend a half an hour on something that they actually learned in sixth grade. Now, let's see what Borat has to say about it. Hello students, welcome to Borat's Scholastic City of Similar Shapes. Today I want you to see the wonderful difference between two things being exactly the same versus similar. <laughs> I used the Vokey, which was a lot of fun and it was actually one of the characters from a movie that a lot of them recognize and so you just kind of type in whatever you want him to say and it worked out really well. He told them about similar polygons and how they were different. Can you name two things that you think may be similar in your life? We've learned dilations the first semester, so growing on what they already know, that's one of the biggest things that I'm trying to push and get out of them this year is you already know how to do a lot of this stuff, now let's apply it. The kids want you to really care and give them anything that's other than a piece of paper and a pencil. I mean, we're in 2012, and this is completely different, and yes, math is, you gotta, you know, there's, there's certain rules that you still have to follow, but you don't have to do it with the pen and paper. You guys might have learned these terms before. Does anyone know what it's called when we have to figure out how many times bigger the actual one is than the blueprint? Well, then we had um, a smart lesson, so it was an interactive. We used some whiteboards. We usually use the whiteboards pretty frequently so I can get instant feedback, okay? Do, what are we thinking? Everyone needs to have an opinion at all times. So um, if we're doing an activity or a quick practice and they don't know what the question is or they don't know how to answer it, I tell them, write IDK. I don't know, that's fine, but you have to have an opinion. And the last thing, which we're gonna explain next time, is that you need to make sure you choose which figure you're going to start with. The big activity was coloring the corresponding sides. That's, do you really understand what's similar? What are we setting up as proportions? So that was the main activity, and then at the end, I gave them a homework assignment using the Wordle, and that just kind of said, hey, pick two of the words, think about them tonight, and then next class, you can come in front of the class and explain what those two words are. Come up to the board meeting. <laughs> Kids these days are wonderful multitaskers, and I think that we shouldn't take that away from them. We need to put it in their hands. Rashad, I'd like for you to draw where the antenna on that picture is right here. They just love being a part of the action, and they want to be a part of it. They just always are so intuitive, and they always just love to ask questions. There's a couple assessments that I did in class, and the first one was the anticipatory set. And that the way that I usually do the anticipatory set is they do it, they switch it with a partner, and then they've gotten back the responses just then. So they know exactly how far, or how many they've gotten right, I know exactly where everybody is, and then I also put that into the grade book, so that gets turned in. The second thing is the whiteboards. I mean, that's instant feedback. What do, you, what do you know, what's your opinion, put it up, and I know exactly within 30 seconds what everybody's thinking. And then the third thing that I did was um, the actual activity. And that's where they color in corresponding sides with the corresponding colors. And that way I can see, hey, do they understand the concept of corresponding? What, what does it mean to be similar? Got to get through my class to graduate. And, um, and the kids know that, and I think that's ex extra push. I know I have to actually understand it. I can't just turn something in and get a grade for it, because at the end of the year, they need to show that, prove that they actually know it. You have to hit the kids where when you talk to them and you can explain it, they get it. But you also have to do the visual. You also, you know, you have to go through all of the means in order to reach all of the kids. But making it hands-on, making it enjoyable. You know, come to class, if you're excited, they're going to be excited. So get plenty of sleep. That's my, <laughs> my tidbit, get plenty of sleep.